Thank you for joining us for this interview with Dr. Lee Edwards. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening's interview is part of the 13th annual Kosciuszko Chair Conference. This conference is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies and the Center for Intramarium Studies. This evening, we'll be hearing from Dr. Lee Edwards. Dr. Edwards is a Distinguished Fellow in Conservative Thought at the B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies at the Heritage Foundation and an Adjunct Professor of Politics at the Catholic University of America. Dr. Edwards is a leading historian of American conservatism and an author or editor of over 25 books. He was the founding director of the Institute of Political Journalism at Georgetown University and a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I'd like to thank Dr. Edwards for joining us this evening. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Hodakevich and Dr. Edwards. Thank you. It's business as usual here at IWP, including at the Kosciuszko Chair in the Center for Intermarium Studies. Today, we have uh, our friend, one of the founding professors of the Institute of World Politics, as well as the head of the Victims of Communism Foundation, which used to be based out of the Institute of World Politics, Dr. Lee Edwards. I'm very pleased to have you. Thank you for being here. As well, I said, you, you're the host because you're the original IW, IWP faculty. I'm a junior faculty. <laughs> Merrick, I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. And yes, I was just saying earlier that um, it so happens that John Lenchowski and I had lunch on Capitol Hill, what, some 30 years ago now, at which he discussed his idea, his dream, his vision of, a, of an institute looking at the principles of statesmanship and history and not uh, any kind, very much of a qualitative approach to education and to, to foreign affairs and international relations. And I encouraged him in some small way that I could. And I just said, John, you have to realize that it's gonna take a little longer than you think to really establish it. And that's precisely what John has done. His, he's just been absolutely indefatigable. Uh, and I'm pleased to have been, played some small part at the very beginning and still do with, with IWP. So thank you very much, Merrick, for inviting well, me. Pleased to Thank be you. with you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy you were one of the people who inspired John Lenchowski to build our institution. Uh, we're talking today because Dr. Lee Edwards' book, The Conservative Revolution, I name it The Conservative Counter Revolution, uh, is about to be published in Poland through uh, the efforts of the Kosciuszko Chair and good people uh, on the ground in Poland. It's a momentous occasion for me because there's nothing better, as far as I'm concerned, uh, than sharing American conservatism with the Poles. Its roots, there is nobody better in the world right now, maybe by default because very many are gone, but nobody better who knows everybody in the American conservative movement. And that would be Dr. Edwards. So I have a few questions to Dr. Edwards. Why did you write your book? <laughs> That's a wonderful question, Merrick. Well, I, among other things, I was inspired by Winston Churchill, who was once asked, well, uh, Mr. Churchill, how do you know what history is going to say about you? And he said, well, I know very well because I'm going to write it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is so, a very good point. If look, you don't do it, someone will do it for you and will not do it well. Exactly, Merrick. And I looked around at the text and my the, the, revolu the conservative revolution is about 20 years old now, looking around even before then, and I just didn't find any really good books, textbooks, or popular histories, uh, either in uh, on the left or on the right. I mean, not, nobody in the movement, conservative movement, and certainly none of the liberal historians were paying much attention 
to the conservative movement. And I said, well, I know what history is going to say about the conservative movement because I'm going to write it. <laughs> I'm happy to say that over these last uh, two and a half or so, three decades, I've been able to write some 20 books or so about various aspects, various personalities of the conservative movement. So for me, there was an intellectual void which had to be filled and I've tried to do my very best, and maybe it's not been too bad, to, to fill that gap and that, and that void. Great. Uh, please tell us about the inception of the modern American conservative movement. Well, you know, it's interesting that the movement is seen perhaps only in political terms. But to me, the conservative movement it combines. It is both an intellectual movement and also a political movement. And if you go back to the very beginning in the post-World War II period, you will see that there were a couple of intellectuals, uh, philosophers who came together uh, and began writing about conservatism. One of them was Friedrich Hayek, uh, the well-known uh, Austrian economist who won the Nobel Prize for economics years later, who wrote a little book called The Road to Serfdom, in which he laid out a classical liberal guide for people if they wanted to be interested in the conservative way of approaching life and economics. And then a few years later, uh, that was in 1944-45, then a few years later in the early 50s, Russell Kirk, uh, a really unknown professor at uh, Michigan State here in America, wrote a book which had an enormous uh, impact, and that was The Conservative Mind. And as a matter of fact, he not only laid out uh, that there was a conservative legacy in America, starting with John Adams and the founders and continuing through T.S. Eliot into the 20th century. <clears throat> but as in point of fact, he gave the conservative movement its name. Up until that time, we had no name. Some of us called ourselves individualists, others uh, classical liberals, others Jeffersonian Republicans and on and on. But it was Russell Kirk with the conservative mind laying out that there were conservative thinkers and poets and politicians starting with the founding of our republic in the late uh, 18th century and continuing into the present, which really uh, in, the, in a total uh, made and made up and laid down a philosophical and then for a political movement called the conservative movement. I am delighted that you have stressed culture with T.S. Eliot and especially uh, Russell Kirk. And since we all need to make a living in a decent way, there is no better approach than on Hayek. That's in a nutshell. My, uh, Next question is really a follow-up. Who are the main players, aside from the ones you've mentioned? What was their formula, for instance? We still talk about the big tent, and I think it's worth stressing because in my experience, you are the most inclusive person. When I get annoyed, you are the most inclusive person because you look for what we all have in common. Well. I would say that um, the person who really first brought together these various strains of uh, conservatism, uh, say a, a Hayek, a classical liberal, he never called himself a libertarian. He said, he said, as a matter of fact, he said, I'm an old Whig. <laughs> That's, but I, in our terminology, we would say a classical liberal uh, probably is the best way of describing uh, Hayek. And then Russell Kirk, the more traditional conservative, uh, believing in culture, as you've said, Merrick, uh, believing in history, uh, believing in the and believing in God. I mean, that was certainly a key part of what he saw as a traditional form of conservatism. But how do you bring these of uh, these different strains together? And the one who first did that was William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, when he founded National Review way back in 1955. And National Review, I'm happy to say, is still going strong, not only in a print edition, but also in an online uh, digital version as well and doing very well indeed. 
And it was Bill Buckley's genius <clears throat> to reach out and to bring together traditional conservatives, libertarian conservatives, and but how to keep them together. That was the great challenge. And for him, he said, what we must do is stop talking about what separates us and let's focus on a common enemy. And the common enemy in the 1950s and for decades following that was the Soviet Union. And people like Nikita Khrushchev who said, we will bury you and your grandchildren, your meaning American and those in the West, your grandchildren will live under communism. So it Bill looks Buckley, like it's coming true. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. But Bill said, let's come together. Let's focus on that common enemy. Let's use that as, uh, he didn't put it this way to use this word, but let's use anti-communism as the cement which will bring together these various strains of conservatism. And that's precisely what happened intellectually starting in the 1950s, the 1960s. And then along came the politicians like a Barry Goldwater in the 1960s and then a little bit later, Ronald Reagan. Both of these political leaders, one a senator from Arizona, the other a governor from California, both of them were what we call fusionists reaching out to different strains of conservatism, bringing them together, keeping them together through tact, through diplomacy, and through encouraging conservatives of all brands to concentrate on what brings us together, what keeps us together. And for so many years, it was the clear and present danger of communism. This is uh, fantastic. Uh, what do you think was the greatest success of American conservatism and how was it achieved? Well, I think intellectually, we would have to say that the founding of National Review and keeping it together uh, was uh, because it, it was there as a, as a gathering place, as an opportunity, as a platform, if you will, for conservative writers and thinkers of all ages. I mean, I... <laughs> I was I was living on the left bank, Merrick, and trying to write the great American novel and failing miserably, uh, receiving rejection slip after rejection slip of my fiction. And then one day I wrote a little piece about France where I was living and that the fact that it was going down uh, the tubes and was going to become a third class power unless it elected some strong leader. And this was prior to Charles de Gaulle sent off this piece to National Review, uh, never met Bill Buckley, didn't know him, and immediately he agreed to publish it. Well, that was my first published piece, but it was a piece of nonfiction. And I always say that Bill Buckley saved me from myself. <laughs> if it had not been for him and publishing that piece, I might still be over on the left bank of Paris trying to write that great American novel and drinking myself to death. Uh, but I was saved from that by Bill Buckley. And then I think that the great fusionist politically really was, was Ronald Reagan. And of course, those wonderful, what we call the golden years of the 1980s, when what did Ronald Reagan do? He restored Americans' confidence in themselves. He sparked a period of economic prosperity through supply side economics which continued for decades, and three, and most re remarkably, uh, he ended the Cold War by winning it, uh, and which no American president had tried to do before Ronald Reagan assumed the presidency. Yeah, he was my first president and the greatest ever. Uh, he, so the greatest success of conservatism was that it actually stayed together as a coalition, a fusionist coalition. Because without that, there could be no defeat of communism. There could be no Reagan. None of this would have happened. Yeah. It's true, you know, that uh, Ronald Reagan, who was a great reader uh, of, of books and magazines and papers, uh, was an original, almost an original subscriber of National Review. Uh, and on more than one occasion said that he got a lot of his ideas from the articles which were published in National Review, including 
those by Frank Meyer, who really was the originator of the idea of fusionism. So there's a direct line there, a direct line between Bill Buckley and Ronald Reagan, between National Review and the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Uh, it's, it, it's something which is very unique because if you ask a liberal, uh, okay, you're a progressive, you're a liberal, maybe you're a socialist now, you know, who are you, who are the people, who, who are your, your basic philosophers? Name me some people. And they're, I mean, aside from saying Karl Marx, <laughs> uh, who is what, 200 years old now, uh, they, 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 are, they are really, really tested to be able to come up with them. Whereas with conservative movement, we have philosophers like Hayek and Kirk, we have popularizers like Bill Buckley and Rush Limbaugh, and we have politicians like Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan and Newt Gingrich. I, I always like to include uh, Gingrich in that, uh, that part. I like, I like Speaker Gingrich and his wife Kalista very much. Uh, so the penultimate question is, how relevant is the old conservative formula for today? with the rise of populism, alt-right, challenges all over the place, the pre-revolutionary situation we have in our streets, creeping revolution in our uh, universities and in the government bureaucracy of all levels. How relevant is this? Well, I think probably at first glance, people would say totally irrelevant. <laughs> And as a matter of fact, there are some conservatives who have written that, who have said, oh, well, you know, uh, conservatism in any form is, uh, is uh, old fashioned, it's, uh, it's archaic, uh, it's yesterday, and let's, let's get on with it. Well, I, would, I always come back and I say, well, that's like saying that the Ten Commandments are, old are outdated, <laughs> right? And outdated and no longer <laughs> relevant. Uh, there are certain ideas, there are certain principles, and among them are the Ten Commandments, which makes sense because otherwise you have chaos. Otherwise, you have you know total uh, revolution <clears throat> going on every single day. So I would say this, that it was precisely because we are in this pre-revolutionary period, uh, precisely because we're so divided, uh, it's precisely because we are so uncertain about the future, that conservatism makes sense. Conservatism stands on certain ideas, certain principles, which are as relevant today as they have always been. And what are those ideas? They can be summed up in five ideas, Merrick. Number one, limited constitutional government. And that important word there is constitutional government. And we can see that with what's going on right now with our Supreme Court. Secondly, a free enterprise, the free market. <clears throat> it is, happens to be the case that more people around the world have come out of poverty in the last 20 years than in any other time in human history. And that is because of free enterprise and the market economy, not because of socialism. Three, <clears throat> individual freedom and individual responsibility. Now, Milton Friedman, a great libertarian, uh, once said that yes, freedom is important and maybe even all important, but as important is what you do with that freedom, how responsible you are in the use of it. <clears throat> Fourth, uh, traditional American values uh, based upon our Judeo-Christian heritage. You can't separate America. You can't, accept, you can't separate our exceptionalism by ignoring that we do have that Judeo-Christian heritage. And finally, the fifth idea is something that Ronald Reagan preached and believed in, and that is what he called peace through strength, what I think can be summed up as a strong national defense. That's the way to secure peace, is to prepare for war. And it seems to me that those five basic ideas, which are really not only the ideas of the founding, but the ideas of Western civilization, are what can bring us through 
this testing time that we find ourselves in today. Fabulous. I agree. Some things never change. They may mutate, but the essence remains the same. <clears throat> and they are very useful points of reference. Would you like to say anything to your Polish readers? Well, Please. I would like to say this, <clears throat> that I'm delighted that there's going to be a Polish edition of my, of my book because I was born in the second largest Polish city in the world. And that city, of course, is Chicago. <laughs> uh, I was born not only in Chicago, but I was born on the south side of Chicago, which is where most of the Poles once lived, maybe not so much anymore. So I've always felt an affinity for the Polish people, for their spirit, for their patriotism, for their love of Zbrodowska. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've always felt, as a matter of fact, I even had a Polish girlfriend when I lived in Paris. Uh, that was long before I met my wonderful, beautiful wife today. So uh, I feel a, an affinity for the people of Poland. I'm delighted that my book is going to be there. And let me say, perhaps more seriously, what happens in Poland is all important for not only Eastern Europe, but all of Europe, and for that matter, all of the world. Poland leads the way in so many ways, and it led the way in the collapse of communism through things like the Solidarity Union and other acts in, of patriotism and of uh, belief in, uh, in so many ways. So we look to Poland. To, to be a leader, and it is a leader, and I'm sure will continue to be a leader in the in the decades ahead. Thank you very much. I'm sure St. John Paul II is praying for you. Amen. I would be. Amen. Welcome. Thank you very much. 